Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to today's conversation, previewing the release of the fiscal year 2023 defense budget. My name is Seamus Daniels, and I'm the Associate Director for Defense Budget Analysis at CSIS. Now, today, February 7th, is the first Monday of February when the White House is required by statute to deliver its budget to Congress. But since we don't have the Biden administration's FY23 request, we've organized a fantastic lineup of defense budget experts who happen to have a little more free time on their hands today. So introducing our speakers, we have Mackenzie Eaglin, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Dr. Stacy Pettyjohn, the director of the defense program at the Center for a New American Security, Dr. Travis Sharp, fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, Thomas Spohr, director of the Center for National Defense at the Heritage Foundation, and our very own Todd Harrison, director for defense budget analysis, as well as director of the aerospace security project here at CSIS. Big thank you to all of our speakers for joining us this afternoon. Now, last week I emailed all of them a set of questions on their expectations and predictions for the FY 2023 budget. And we'll kick off today's conversation by getting their take on those questions. Uh, we'll wrap up the session uh, with Q&A from the audience. So please be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen here on Zoom. But to kick it off, uh, we'll take a look at our first question. We asked our experts, when do you expect the FY 2023 budget and the 2022 national defense strategy to be released? And you can see we had a pretty wide range of responses from our experts' predictions for the budget request, but a little more agreement on the timing of the NDS. Everyone expects it to come out before the budget drops. Now, Obviously, complicating this a bit is the fact that there are still, still no regular appropriations for FY22. We're on a continuing resolution until February 18th. We're not sure what comes after that just yet. But to kick things off, Travis, let's start with you. Uh, you were the most optimistic about the release of the FY 2023 budget. Um, what was your reasoning for March 14th? And do you think the NDS release will affect the release of the budget itself? Thanks, Seamus. So my prediction is based on politics. Uh, so if you leave aside the first year budget request, because first year budget requests are usually delayed because a new administration is entering office, and you just look at the budgets that were requested after that, uh, the Trump administration's tardiest budget request was late by 35 days. So if you count 35 days from today, that takes you to March 14th. So if the Biden administration releases its budget any day later than March 14th, then it will have submitted a budget request tardier than the Trump administration ever did. So I think, you know, administrations kind of tend to compare themselves to the previous. They like to draw these distinctions for political purposes. So I'm setting down March 14th as a political type marker. As for the relationship with the, uh, with the national defense strategy, um, previous administrations have tended to release the strategy prior to the budget request. Uh, there's been a gap there. There could be many reasons why that's the case. Maybe they want people to digest the strategy for a few days before the budget request comes along. So my expectation is that you should see the, the budget request and the strategy come out um, about a week apart. So I'm forecasting March 7th as being the release date for the national defense strategy, which also coincides with the historical average for these types of documents over the last 25 years or so. Got it. Mackenzie, you predicted the budget would drop on March 21st, but that could be pushed back into April if there's another short term CR passed for the FY22 appropriations. How optimistic are you that Congress will actually pass regular appropriations at the end of this current CR? Um, and, and, second, and secondly, Who's more to blame for the delay in appropriations and the budget request? 
Uh, are you going to put that more on the White House, Congress, split it between the two? Oh, you gave me the hard question that makes me no friends, Seamus. Um, yes, so they will not complete appropriations by February 18th. Uh, the next CR will run through March 11th. And that's what's being discussed on Capitol Hill. And that's so you heard it here first. Tune in for Seamus's events for good breaking info. Uh, and I, the challenge there will, of course, be, well, many. That's a half year under continuing resolution, give or take. And I'm not... I'm not sure that's going to be enough to get this over the finish line either. It's the, there's still no framework deal, you know, as in um, not just on the riders, which I think are actually pretty easy to solve, but on, on parity or not for defense and non-defense discretionary. And if they can't get there now, I just, I don't know if they can get there ever. So uh, it's the first time in since 9-11 I, that I've ever seen the, the possibility of a year long CR is this real. Uh, I, I ultimately think appropriators are optimistic. So I'm gonna cheer for that because obviously I think it would be a disaster of epic proportions for the defense department uniquely for so many reasons we all know, but um, I, it, there's a lot of things happening. So who's to blame? Well, there's one party control of government. So, you know, I think that, um, to say it's because they're not sure where the 22 number will end up is silly because there are more votes in Congress to increase defense than to cut it. It's gonna end up at or near or above the uh, defense authorization bill that was signed into law. It's only a question of like, is it gonna be that before? Or is that gonna be a number from which they build to get some sort of final fiscal deal uh, on non-defense discretionary? Um, and so that to me signals that it just wasn't a priority for the White House. Wish I were wrong, not trying to pick on anybody, it just seems to be the case with floor time in the Senate being of course the most uh, important factor in all of this. And I believe that it was to free up floor time for other priorities at the direction of the White House. Thanks. And Tom, you know, can you go into what the effects of a CR of this length are? Um, and you know what the what the impact of a late budget request, what that actually means for the department. Yeah, th <clears throat> thanks, Seamus. Appreciate it, and, I, and I'm honored to be on this panel with all of these distinguished people. Yeah, the effects of the CR, as we heard in a appropriations or committee uh, meeting last month, are pretty significant. I mean, it's one the Department of Defense is being hit by inflation that they have not seen in years, so the cost of things that they anticipated for 22, 2022 is you know, 5%, 6% higher than they thought they were going to be. So they have to grapple with that. They have to grapple with paying a pay raise, a 2.7% pay raise uh, to the military folks, which took effect January the 1st, with no additional funding in their coffers. And I, I looked at that for the Army. That's $100 million a month just for the Army. So uh, bad for all of the Pentagon. And then there's the traditional problems we talk about with the CR, the inability to start new programs, the limitations on setting, starting out new contracts. You know, so this is, I think, probably the worst effects of a CR uh, that we have ever, you know, CRs have become, you know, kind of very accustomed to in Washington, DC. We almost treat them as routine. This one, I think, is really biting, really hurting uh, the Department of Defense. That plus their support to the Afghan resettlement mission has kind of been a, a double whammy on this one. And so, um, particularly pernicious effects of the CR. And, and Seamus, I forgot the second part of your question. The impact of a, of a delayed budget request. Yeah. And so we saw this last year. This is like the movie, same movie we saw last year in that Congress, even on its best day, is slow. And so the fact that they're going to get this budget late again is probably going to push back posture hearings. It'll push back uh, committee work at the HASC and the SASC and the and the SACD and the HACD, it's just gonna push the whole process back. And a year from now, we're gonna be sitting around wringing our hands saying, why is the Department of Defense under a continuing resolution again? And part of that is gonna be because, you know, you just can't accelerate what Congress does very efficiently. Seamus, I just wanna, I agree with that, Tom. I just wanna say the impacts of CR plus inflation is costing the department four to 6 billion a month of reduced buying power they're basically backtracking into sequestration by another name at those rates. Yep. Thanks to both of you. Um, 
wrapping up the, the conversation about timing here, Todd, I, I don't want to call you a pessimist, but your prediction of April 15th is a long time to wait for the budget request, especially when it's not in the first year of a new administration. Why do you think the budget will be so delayed? Yeah, well, I think the fact that it's delayed right now, um, it, it's not just a matter of FY22 not being settled. You can release the next budget request without the previous one having been enacted yet. That's happened a couple of times in the recent past even. Um, so I, I think that that tends to be more of an excuse. And once they extend the CR again, um, that's not going to be, you, you've, you have to decouple the FY23 request from FY22 appropriations. You just have to. Um, and so I really think this delay represents there's internal turmoil and division within the Biden administration. And I don't think it's about defense. I think it's about the non-defense side of the budget. And I think that is gumming up the works for the whole budget request uh, and making it delayed. And when you've got that kind of internal turmoil and division, what do you put in from the Build Back Better program? What do you, you know, what do you try to build into this, uh, you know, non-defense budget? Um, you know, what do you keep? What do you don't? Uh, don't keep in it. I, I think that means this is going to be a budget request that they want to bury, uh, that they don't want that to lead the news. Uh, and so what better timing to bury a budget request than to release it on a Friday that is tax day, that is the Friday before the Easter holiday, uh, that is also spring break for a lot of the schools around in this area. So for us analysts, it's the worst possible day. Uh, so I think if they want to bury it, that's a great day. And recall, last year, that's what they did. They waited to release the budget request until the Friday before Memorial Day weekend. Like, come on. <laughs> so that's my prediction. I think that they want to bury this. They don't want to have to deal with a lot of headlines because of that. Hey, uh, Seamus, let me just piggyback on that. And uh, Travis talked about the political dimension. There's also just a very much of a linear problem. And that is they still need to get out the national security strategy. They need to explain that a, a week at least probably needs to pass. And then they need to come out with a national defense strategy about a week needs to pass. And then they can come out with a budget so that if they've made any major moves in the budget, they've got the defense strategy to say, hey, well, look, we're, we're emphasizing this and we're de-emphasizing that. If they don't do that, they're really gonna get hammered, I think on budget release. Let's continue on on the, that theme of the national defense strategy for 2022, what we actually expect from it. Uh, the second question that we asked all of our experts here, if I can share my screen, how different do you expect the 2022 NDS to be from its 2018 predecessor? Um, a, a few differences and a lot of continuity, some differences, but still more continuity than change, significant differences, or a radical departure. You've seen that the majority of our experts here went with the some differences, but still more continuity uh, from change. Uh, Stacy, I, I wanna get your take on this. What do you think the points of departure will be? What do you think are the main tenants that are gonna stick moving forward from 2018 into 2022? Thanks. Um, uh, so I think we've heard repeatedly from senior administration officials that China is still, you know, the pacing challenges, they like to say. And so I would expect that thread to be the same as it was under the Trump administration. But whether that actually remains true in practice and whether China is uh, the first among all challenges or more of a peer, I think there are a lot of questions. And the world is really putting to test the idea that the United States and the Defense Department can prioritize right now with everything that you see, which is going on around Ukraine with the Russian troop buildups in um, Russia and in Belarus around the border that uh, seems to suggest that Russia is preparing to invade. That obviously raises concerns about security within Eastern uh, Europe and American NATO allies. And then you see there's this continued problem in the Middle East, which the administration has chosen to respond to as well um, with the Houthis and missiles and sending F-22s to Al Dafra. And so uh, while there has been a lot of talk about prioritizing China and in the Indo-Pacific region, 
Um, the, the rest of the world keeps clamoring for an American attention. So I think there are questions about that. The other big area where I wonder if there may be a significant difference from the Trump administration is on nuclear posture. Um, the Trump uh, with their posture review went farther than other administrations in terms of being concerned about limited nuclear use, especially by Russia, and had adopted language that said that the United States might consider responding with nuclear weapons in, uh, in response to significant uh, attacks on the US. I forget the exact language, but it was broadening it slightly. Um, and with the Biden administration, we've heard President Biden, before he was uh, in office, had said that he was committed to the idea of sole purpose, where you actually walk that back and say that the United States would only use nuclear we weapons in response to a nuclear weapons attack on, its, on the U.S. or its allies. Um, and there's been talk about potentially rolling back some of the Trump administration nuclear additions in terms of the um, uh, nuclear cruise missile and the low yield um, submarine launch ballistic missile um, that just began in the last few years or in the case of the slick men are just about to get started. Thank you. So regional priorities and nuclear posture are what we should be looking out for. Travis, over to you. You said that you expect a lot of continuity with the 2018 strategy. Um, you know, essentially you were saying that if there's a new strategy, just because it's new doesn't mean that the stuff in it is actually new. Am I getting that right? Yeah, that's right. I think may maybe I have too high of a standard, but I'll just outline what my standard is. So for me, for the strategy to be a departure, it's gotta be saying something along the lines of abandoning allies, abandoning geographic theaters. To me, that's a departure. You're talking about large scale, uh, difference in what has been a decades long US defense strategy. Um, for a difference, I think rebranding existing concepts using new phrases, to me, that doesn't constitute a substantive difference. Um, in fact, I think one of our jobs as analysts, the first thing we try to do is when the new concepts with the new names come out, we try to tie them to things that have come before to try to try to figure out where that, that continuity is. Um, I'll just say one difference that I would really like to see in strategy, I don't know if it'll provide it, um, but over the last few years, there's been a, a huge emphasis within the department on prioritizing research and development spending. And um, indeed the, the R&D share of the budget has been increasing steadily over the last decade. Uh, the thing I worry about is it's really hard to figure out how well we're doing with R&D. Like what's the measuring stick to know whether or not the R&D investments that we're making are paying off? Uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated question to ask, but at least me going into the strategy budget season, I'm gonna be skeptical uh, about the department just saying, hey, we're making this biggest R&D budget of all time. I mean, because of inflation, every single year's budget has a good chance of being the, the largest R&D budget of all time. Um, so I would like to see the strategy pay more attention to really differentiating these are the key areas of investment for R&D that we think have long-term benefits to the U.S. in strategic competition, rather than just spreading investments all across the R&D accounts. If I could jump in real quickly, uh, just yeah. on, you've heard uh, Assistant Secretary Shu say that she was hoping to further prioritize, I think it was something like 12 or 14 technology area priorities that the Trump administration has, but they've actually expanded the list, which, uh, suggests that things might not be trending in the direction that uh, Travis would like to see. We're going to be digging more into the R&D budget uh, in, in, a, in a few questions. Um, but sticking on the NDS, uh, Tom, you think there will be significant differences. What are those going to be? Yeah, I do. And using Travis's definition of significant departures, I think, first off, let me say that I hope what I'm about to say isn't true. I hope that uh, Travis is right. We see a lot more continuity than, than I expect, but I think we're gonna open the national defense strategy and we're gonna find priority one will be preventing climate change. And I think we're gonna see priority number two to be fighting COVID. And then number three or somewhere below that will be something about China wrapped 
uh, all through this will be this notion of integrated deterrence, which nobody really has a, uh, I think, a firm definition on. But it's, the more I hear administration officials talk about it, it's using all elements of national power uh, to deter our adversaries, which sounds good. And it's a great national strategy. But for the Pentagon, for the Defense Department, their job, their part of that strategy is to build sufficient military power of the quality and the quantity we need uh, to deny adversaries the ability to accomplish their objectives. And I think, again, I hope I'm not right in this, but I think we're going to see the department, the administration kind of walk away from that goal. They're going to talk a lot about how they're going to emphasize the role of allies, particularly in Europe, and that the the United States is going to do less and allies are going to do more. And I, nobody thinks allies are more important uh, than I do, but we need to be realistic about our allies. Most, you know, uh, two thirds of the NATO allies aren't even spending 2% of their gross domestic product on defense, even though they all agreed to that in Wales. Uh, most countries can't even afford a squadron of fifth generation aircraft. And so while allies are great for basing rights and international uh, coalitions and things like that, when it comes to confronting a power like uh, the Russian Federation or China, there's only a few countries in the world that can muster the necessary military power uh, to confront those kind of guys. And I think relying on adversaries to agree, or allies, excuse me, to a greater degree is, is folly. Thanks, Tom. And you had a great piece for our um... Bad Ideas in National Security Series uh, in December that outlined those thoughts on it. So thank you. Uh, Todd and Kenzie, do you want to weigh in on the NDS and, and what you expect? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, you know, I, I think it also is going to be uh, more continuity than change. I mean, the main reason I say that is if you look at the 2018 NDS, um, while you know, the folks who worked on it like to point out all the differences, it was, a, it was basically going in the same direction uh, that defense strategy had already been going since at least 2012 in the defense strategic guidance, but certainly the 2014 QDR uh, was you know, doing a lot of the same thing. So I think it continued in that direction. For that reason, I think that this NDS is also going to continue in the same direction. Uh, but also, I think bureaucratically, uh, a defense strategy like this is ultimately a consensus product. It's the least common denominator of what can make it through the bureaucracy, right? Uh, and so it's got to get through the, you know, the uniform military leadership, the civilian leadership, not just in DOD, but across the national defense enterprise, including the White House and the National Security Council. To get any kind of significant change through all of those uh, you know, bureaucratic organizations, I think is nearly impossible without some sort of a, a forcing function externally uh, that has changed all of a sudden. And we don't have that. It hasn't changed. Uh, the forcing functions we have are, have been relatively steady for years now. Um, I think where we are going to see minor changes, I would call it semantics. Um, you know, talking about climate change, cultural issues, COVID, that's great. That's window dressing. It doesn't actually change the substance of what you're doing your in your defense program. Um, it's only marginal changes uh, on the edges there. Uh, I think that we'll see great power competition reworded, call it something else. And yep, they can talk about integrated deterrence a lot. That's a you know an easy thing to throw out. And who can't agree with integrated deterrence? But if you stop and think about it, is there disintegrated deterrence? Is that a thing? Did we ever have that? I'm, I'm not sure that was ever a strategy. Uh, so, you know, integrated deterrence sounds great. I don't think it has a lot of meaning. It's going to be another one of those buzzwords that comes and goes within a couple of years. And Mackenzie, any final thoughts on the NDS? I think that was a good summary. Uh by Todd, I, I tend to agree, you know, integrated deterrence is a term uh, originated from strategic command. And it was about conventional nuclear deterrence being more integrated. It's something I've talked about with uh, Kath Hicks and others before she went into this administration previously. So it has like a, a reason for existence, but it's certainly not what the Secretary of Defense has taken it to mean. He is certain he's made it his term, which of course he's more than allowed to do. And I, I think it does have a couple of different angles, including the allies, including whole of government approaches to problems, including domestic renewal here in the US, which I think will be a big priority of the defense strategy. Uh, 
and then uh, a couple other uh, pieces to it. But that, when it has that many different sort of uh, angles to one term underneath it, it, it really risks becoming like Rumsfeld's revolution in military affairs, just, just too much to take in. So all the stakeholders will just um, absorb it as through the lens through which they were already going to do, you know, a, a variety of their own activities. Thanks. And let's bring it back to the budget now. Uh, the next question I asked uh, our, our panelists here today was to come up with a headline for what would describe the 2023 defense budget when it's released. They got creative here, uh, starting off with dancing the limbo, just how low can DOD go? Uh, late again, defense budget boosts technology investments less than meet the eye. Uh, inflation, inflation, inflation. Uh, Pentagon budget prioritizes high-tech R&D while standoff with Russia over Ukraine continues. And back to the future, record R&D investments again. So we have some, uh, some common themes there, uh, but let's start off with the, with the exciting title of inflation, inflation, inflation. Uh, Todd, this is what you're most concerned about this budget cycle? Well, I think that's going to be the news uh, when the budget request comes out. Uh, and it's not actually going to be about defense. Uh, it's going to be about what assumptions does OMB make in their official budget documents for what inflation will be in the future. I think the markets are going to be looking at that number. If it's a realistic number uh, that we're going to have higher than historical um, inflation uh, in 23 and probably 24 as well, maybe we're turning more towards normal 25 and 26. If that, if they put realistic inflation assumptions in there, it will be an official Biden administration government document that is telling everyone that high inflation, higher than historical inflation, will be continuing for years to come. Uh, and I think that that's going to be a downer, uh, quite frankly, on the markets, and that'll be the headliner. Or they could put unrealistic inflation assumptions and say, hey, it's going to get back to around 2% next year. Uh, and that will be the story then, uh, that they lowballed inflation uh, and they're not being realistic. And therefore, it's making you know, the, the budget numbers they, they put in there look higher than they will actually be in real terms once you make a realistic adjustment for inflation. So I, I think that, you know, they're in an impossible situation here. And that's why I think the headline's not going to be about the defense budget at all. I think it'll be about inflation assumptions and, and all the different ripple effects that inflation is having within the defense budget and the non-defense side of the federal budget. Tom, from your headline, you don't anticipate that they'll actually take into consideration inflation on the top line defense budget number. Have I got that right? Yeah, Seamus, I think they're going to resubmit. They're going to try it again at 2%. And I also think they may even resubmit a budget that's only 1.6, 1.7% growth. And so the combination of those two things is going to set, set us up for a, a horrifically low defense top line for 2023. The reason I think that I uh, you know, I have to go back to the political. I think President Biden paid no penalty for submitting a very low defense budget for 2022. The Congress, in a bipartisan manner, uh, elevated it. Um, President Biden did not have to tell his caucus that, hey, guys, we really need to bump up defense. In fact, Congress did that heavy lifting for him. And I see no reason why President Biden would you know, have an epiphany and say, you know what, I really was wrong in 2022, I really think we need a higher defense number. And so I'm gonna do that. And so I think we're just gonna, you know, see him run the same play up the middle again and get stopped on the zero yard line kind of thing. And then for our final three headlines, the common trio of, uh, of R&D investments from Mackenzie, Stacy, and Travis. Um, it sounds like you're all expecting a high RD t &E budget again, something DOD has touted for the past two years in the last year of the, uh, at least the last year of the Trump administration, the first year of the Biden administration. What do you think the priorities are going to be for R&D investments this year? And Stacy, going to your point and, and maybe your, uh, your headline, do you think they're going to be targeted enough or are they just going to be touting the general investment in RD t &E? But over to all three of you to weigh in on this. 
Sure. I mean, my fear is that they're not going to be that targeted and that they're actually broadening and that this has been the storyline that the administration wants to put out, that they're making investments in future technologies, which I agree is very, very important and essential. But at the same time, when you factor in what Todd was talking about and, and Tom with inflation and continuing resolutions, the fact that we can't have these new starts, there's none of the flexibility with the money. And then you compound that with the fact that there's still this gap between research and development and actually moving into production contracts and programs of record that in fact, this is yielding less than what the administration really um, wants it to and what the nation really needs. Travis and Mackenzie, would you like to weigh in? Well, I would just say, um, you know, the, the budget request ultimately is always juxtaposed, juxtaposed next to what's happening in the real world. So, you know, you got to kind of feel bad for people within DOD. They're, they're trying to take the program in a direction. They're trying to plan for the future. And then, of course, these, these real world events always crop up. It's for me, the, the kind of interesting question is, what is the signaling value of the current U.S. commitment to R&D spending? What I mean is, potential adversaries and US allies, what message do they gather from the current allocation of the budget um, to R&D and the different priorities? Now, of course, you wouldn't expect that they would all, they're not robotic, so they're not all gonna, gonna respond the exact same way. Uh, but it's, it's really worth asking ourselves, um, what message is this budgetary commitment communicating to potential adversaries and allies? And then, you know, based on the answer to that question, what do we need to be doing as a country to kind of manage those alliance relationships to make sure that that people are drawing accurate conclusions from these investments. I just, yeah. Um, it's interesting that I think the minute, I mean, a couple of senior officials have already said that that's going to be the headline is record R and and I don't, don't expect that, you know, to be untrue. But what's interesting is how much continuity there is in that being the attempted bumper sticker of the defense budget since 2015. I mean, that was uh, back when Bob Work was Deputy Secretary of Defense and made a compelling case for the third offset strategy. That's essentially what he was calling for was more R&D, let a thousand flowers bloom. And then the Trump administration largely continued that under a different name and now we're here. So I'm just struck by how it's just not a new idea. It's just, it's something that's been really now seven fiscal years underway. So, um, Congress will be unhappy with that, is basically what I'm saying, uh, with that outcome, because we already know from this year, they're worried about the Davidson window. They're worried about China's ability to launch the fait accompli in the next five to six years. And they, they're worried about capacity to do that, as well as deter in other places and like, uh, you know, Eastern Europe. And they're going to continue to slap the rest of the uh, Pentagon saying, you know, you're not listening. And I don't know that they'd be wrong in saying that. Yeah, I, if I can jump in here, Seamus, um, you know, one, one more thought on RDT and E funding. Um, so first of all, you have to watch and make sure that if there is, you know, a record number in R&D spending in the next budget request, well, first of all, are they using realistic inflation adjustments, right? So is it a real increase or not? Uh, but secondly, you have to watch what they did last year, where a good portion of that increase was not actually new funding. So part of it, they put in a placeholder for 1.2 billion in mandatory funding uh, for you know, some pandemic preparedness program that was also in several other government um, uh, agency budgets, uh, which is not really defense R&D. Um, and then also part of the R&D increase that we saw, I think it was about a billion and a half dollars, was just transfers from other titles of the budget into R&D uh, through this new funding line, new program, uh, new uh, budget element 6-8 funding. Uh, it's a pilot program for software development. Uh, they were just moving funding that already existed. So that's not new funding. That doesn't count as an increase, even though it's new to RDT&E. Um, so you have to watch for things like that uh, to see if it, if it is a real increase or not. The other point I would make, though, is you know, the strategy uh, has not been and, and should never be uh, to spend more on R&D for the sake of R&D. 
Uh, the strategy, a component of it, should be to modernize, right? To invest in new and innovative technologies that will give us military advantage in the future. And you start with RDT and E investments, but at some point, it has to transition to procurement. You actually have to buy these systems in quantity. You have to field them in your force. And you know what we've seen, uh, as McKinsey and others pointed out, we've seen you know big increases in RDT and E for years now. And I keep waiting to see, okay, when are we going to see that followed up? with real money to procure these systems in quantity, because if we never get to the procurement part of it, uh, then that technology investment is gonna be largely wasted. Yeah, I wanna continue this theme on, you know, how we actually allocate the budget top line, because typically we think of it in terms of trade-offs between modernization, force structure, readiness. Um, if we're expecting modernization and rdt and &E, eventually transitioning into procurement to be the winner in the FY23 request, what's the loser going to be? What, what do we expect this to look over the five-year uh, projections for, for the department's budget? Um, so it, open open four for, for who would like to respond. Tom? You know, I'll just start by saying there doesn't necessarily have to be a loser. There is no, we're not under sequestration caps. And so it's actually possible the defense budget could increase in real terms. Uh, I worry that this administration does see um, end strength cuts as a potential way to free up uh, money. And that's not where I would go, but I think they view uh, people as an unnecessary resource in this uh, view of the future, they hope. Janice, we will see continuity in the bill payer. Um, firstly, it's procurement. Secondly, it's uh, legacy equipment. They're going to take their, you know, in this year's budget, of course, it was about 3 billion in total, according to their calculations and total divestments of so-called legacy equipment across the services. I think they'll attempt to triple, if not quadruple that number next year. Yeah, I, I would jump in here too. I, so I think I, I'm coming at it from a different perspective than Tom. Um, I, I think they should be making some end strength reductions, targeted end strength reductions. Um, and parts of the force structure that are lower priority now that we're out of Iraq and Afghanistan, largely out of the Middle East, or should be, uh, and are focusing on, you know, call it great power competition with China and Russia, there are parts of our force structure that are just not as important anymore. And so if you need to free up money uh, to invest in modernization, I think we ought to be taking in strength cuts. Um, but with that said, I don't think they necessarily will, or I think it will be minor um, that I think they will try to minimize in strength reductions, if not keep it basically flat, in which case MILPERS ends up being the winner uh, in the budget more so than anything else. Because with pay raises, if you keep in strength flat, then your MILPERS budget will be growing. Ultimately, I think the question we run into, though, is if we're looking at end strength, we're looking at legacy programs in terms of bill payers, will Congress go along with that? I mean, based on what we've seen for the past few years, do you think it's feasible if we are talking about it in terms of not growing the defense budget? You know, I will say the easy legacy fruit has been picked. So we're not buying things that don't make any sense anymore. And so now we're into things that soldiers and Marines are actually using today to accomplish their mission. And so divesting legacy system today is means that you're telling a squad of infantrymen, hey, give up this thing or this platform, this weapon system. And so there are no warehouses full of legacy systems anymore. It's stuff we are using today that we would use tomorrow uh, in a China or a Russia fight. Uh, Seamus, Congress has been pretty supportive, actually, of the divestments this year. I know there's a few headlines and outliers like A10, but uh, actually they, they've moved more in the last two years than they have really at any point in the last decade on this, partly because um, the chiefs are out front and forward leading, you know, making the case like the commandant, like General Brown and others. And, and I think they're convincing audiences one by one on the Hill. And so, it, yes, they will go along with some of it, but of course, the 25 billion ish ad on the defense authorization bill, you know, part of the rationale for that was the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, sure. It was about um, uh, 
make, filling in the gaps on the unfunded priorities lists and adding in capacity, which is what you lose uh, with the divest to invest approach oftentimes. And so um, Congress would rather go along and then fill, go plug all those gaps and fill all those holes as they wanna do both, right? They really wanna have it both ways. And I, so I think that the answer is yes, we're going to allow more divestment just like they did this year. And yes, we're gonna add money again, above and beyond the administration's request, whatever it ultimately is. I just wanna piggyback Mackenzie on one thing and this, the idea that the chiefs are behind the idea of divestment. I think it's more a factor of like their leg is trapped underneath a boulder. They've been handed a saw and they've said, if you wanna get out of this mess, you have to saw your leg off. Speaking of cuts and divestment, um, the next question we asked our, uh, asked our panelists, which major acquisition program may be on the chopping block for FY 2023? Um, so our panelists have thrown out the Army's optionally manned fighting vehicles, uh, the nuclear sea launch cruise missile and low yield nuclear submarine warhead. That was two responses. Uh, the Army's future attack reconnaissance aircraft and the MQ-9. Now, I want to start off with uh, with the sea launch cruise missile and the low yield nuclear submarine warhead. Um, Stacy, you touched on this a little bit in your in your opening comments. Um, do you think this is coming more from the administration, from Congress, from both? Um, and Mackenzie, I'd love to get your take too, since this was your this was also your proposal. I think this is coming from two sides, and and it uh, uh, meets constituents' needs in Congress. But you know, some Congress members have been pushing the Biden administration to reduce the United States' reliance on nuclear weapons for its national security, and the president has expressed support of that view as well. So um, one way to do that is to cut these weapon systems that are relatively new, um, and by in public reports, not many have actually been fielded of the new warheads. So um, it's not a tremendous loss, but it is a tangible thing that we are taking away um, without really cutting into the major acquisition programs like GBSD or um, LRSO or any of the other big pieces of nuclear modernization, the B-21. Um, so it's making a sort of gesture in that direction without having to um, cut off an entire limb uh, to take Tom's metaphor there. Yeah, nothing really to add there. It just it's a way to say that, you know, we're doing things differently. We're thinking differently. It's a good tangible example to say, you know, this is how, like here are the results of budgetarily of being different from the last administration. Uh, and it's an obvious, I mean, this is always this area of investment is always the most ideologically divisive one between the two parties. So it's 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 like a no-brainer that that's where change will be made. And Travis, the MQ-9, do you think that's that it will be on the chopping block this budget cycle? I think there's at least going to be a discussion about it. Um, I should say continuation of a discussion because it's already been up for debate for the past few years. Um, two main factors that are going on there. First, uh, what I would call divestment bundling, um, to go back to our previous conversation, I think it's difficult for any of the services uh, to propose a set of aircraft um, and then provide exceptions like, hey, we want to we want to divest from these systems, but this is an exception, right? Because just logically, if you let one system off the hook, then members of Congress are going to say, well, why didn't you let this other system off the hook? So divestment becomes an all or nothing proposition. And I think those dynamics uh, have kind of trapped the MQ-9. Uh, and then the second factor going on is that uh, the system has become a symbol. Uh, it's closely tied to the type of counterterrorism operations that the United States has been doing over the last 20 years. There's a, you know, a feeling that we need to transition to great power competition or whatever we're gonna be calling it in a few months. Um, and so you know, the MQ-9 has been put forward as, as being this, this symbol of needing to transition. Um, I mean, I and some of my colleagues at CSBA, we've done a lot of work on different applications for MQ-9 and other types of systems like that in more of these great power competition scenarios. Um, but the question remains, can people kind of break out of this way that they've been thinking about systems like the MQ-9 um, for the last couple of decades? 
Thanks. And Todd and Tom, obviously you picked, you know, two, uh, two Army programs here. Do you, does this suggest that the Army is going to be the major bill to payer in terms of budget service share uh, in this year's request? Yeah, I, I, I hope it's not so, but I think it might be so. The Army has gone down in real terms over the last four years in 10% in buying power. And, uh, you, you know, I think Todd mentioned it. A lot of the people are similar to the ones that were in the Obama administration eight years ago, and they they uh, they were also squeezing the Army. So I think the Army is going to be squeezed again in 2023, and I think they're going to have to go to places they don't want to go, and one of those places they may have to go is the optionally manned uh, fighting people. Even though it's uh, desperately needed, it replaces the Bradley, which is 40 years old, uh, over 40 years old this year. Um, I don't know that they're going to have any choices. They've already cut all the modernization and procurement programs that they could cut. And so now they're down to the bone, I think. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, I agree. I think the Army is likely to be um, the target in this year's budget. Uh, you know, depending on how all the top line stuff works out, it either, you know, gets cut the most or increases the least, uh, you know, however you look at it, it's the loser, I think, um, in the budget battles this year and probably for the years to come. Um, and, you know, I picked the, uh, the helicopter program. It's a scout attack helicopter, um, part of the future vertical lift uh, program. Um, I think that the Army's going to have a really hard time justifying why they need that kind of capability if we're supposed to be focused on high-end competition, right? Helicopters aren't going to get anywhere near the fight. Uh, and if you're in a, a middle tier competition or a low end competition of some kind, you already have capabilities like the Gray Eagle um, that can provide that scouting and a limited attack capability. Uh, and you've got your legacy helicopters that you can keep around a little bit longer. Um, so I think that that's a program that if it doesn't get killed outright, I think it gets pushed out and slipped into the future um, to pay bills. Because if push comes to shove and the Army's got to come up with money, uh, I think at the end of the day, the Army has shown that it would rather cut modernization programs than cut force structure and end strength. Uh, if you have to come up with money, I think that this is one of the programs that will be on the chopping block. Great. And let's move on to our final question before audience Q&A. Um, again, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, but our final question that we asked our experts was, what will be the ultimate DOD discretionary budget, um, which the Biden administration requested $715 billion for in FY22. The NDA authorized top line is $740 billion. I would just like all of our panelists to go through and uh, explain their rationale behind their uh, prediction, starting with Travis Sharp, who both had the earliest budget and the lowest budget top line. Yeah, so I'm, I'm predicting 733 for the DOD top line. Um, the logic is as follows. That's based on the historical average growth rate for administrations that start off their first budget uh, with a real growth rate somewhere between negative 5% and 5%, um, which I kind of call maintainer administration. So they don't come in and implement huge increases in their first year. And they also don't implement large cuts. They're somewhere in that muddled middle. And if you average out the, the growth rate uh, from year one to year two, it ends up being uh, getting you to about 733 billion um, for the FY23 top line. Um, it's also worth pointing out that when OMB did their budget for last year, they had placeholder projections in there and the placeholder projection was 731 billion. So I don't know how OMB did that, they're magic. Uh, maybe they know secret things, I don't know. Maybe they know way more than I know, but you know, off by 2 billion in the predictions, um, you know, that's like fairy dust when you're talking about defense budgets. So um, I'm going with 733. I, I just have to say, we'll come back in one to two months from now and ultimately pick a winner from all of this, and uh, we'll have to recognize them on Twitter. Uh, but Tom, I guess you technically have two submissions here for uh, 735 or 754, depending on what happens with uh, appropriations for 22. Yeah, I apologize for being wishy-washy. 735 is my number if we go through a full year, if we're, if we're reaching no agreement on the uh, 2022 appropriations, which is kind of 
the path that McKenzie is kind of suggesting we're on. If in fact they get their act together, if they appropriate a 2022 at the level that the NDAA says, uh, then I think it would be 754. Both of those are about a 2% uh, growth uh, over the previous budget. So nothing radical in either case, just depending on where we start. Great. Mackenzie, you're up next with 750. Phew, glad you reminded me. I didn't remember what I said. So <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is actually a, a, the consensus view. Again, I, some of this is subject to change, but I, I think it's very possible it's 731 or 733 with Travis's number. Uh, and, or they take the 2% growth, which would put them at 755, as Tom just said, but I just picked a lower number because, you know, last year's submission, you know, wasn't a full two points for them. So uh, uh, the increase in the request. So nothing really special about it, but I also based it a little bit off of high, you know, going higher than the, than the authorized number signed, you know, by the president. If I have to, though, like that's so we know the band here. The group is all within twenty billion of each other, roughly. Uh, if I, but if I had to, like you know, go put my money down on the tables at Vegas, I'm going seven thirty one. And Stacy, seven fifty five. Same bas basic rationale as uh, Tom and Mackenzie, though. I think this is part of the broader political sort of um, machinations that the administration has with Congress, where they're going to go lower on defense than what they might really want. And they're expecting the Hill to come back and add in and provide them with additional resources for some of the unfunded priorities on the services list. Um, and this this gives them the narrative of higher than last year, but um, not in necessarily, you know, in, in real terms. And they are going to be facing significant pressures due to inflation. And Todd, wrapping it up with you, I guess you and Travis are both the outliers in these uh, sets of questions. 765, uh, yeah. much higher than, than everyone else here. Yeah, I'm, I'm going big. I'll, I'll tell you my rationale. So uh, 765, that is 7% above what they asked for uh, the previous year, 715 billion, right? So 7% increase. How do I get to that? So first of all, about half of that, uh, they know Congress is going to appropriate somewhere around 740 billion this year. They already know that. So that gets you halfway. Uh, and then you get another three and a half percent up from there. Um, just looking at what is inflation going to be. And I'm talking real tangible impacts in the DOD budget. Uh, most importantly, the pay raise. Uh, we know that they've got to be figuring out how to pay for a 4.6% pay raise. That's the ECI that they are going to be pegged to for this year. We know that the allowances for housing, uh, it's going to be a big increase uh, in, in the BAH. Uh, we know we'll see a big increase in the allowance for subsistence. Uh, so all your personnel costs, civilian and military, are going up. Uh, and you've just got general inflation on everything else, a lot of your services and uh, things that you're contracting for. That's going to be hit uh, sooner with inflationary impacts. So I think you know they look at you know 740 is where they're likely to be in FY22. They tack on inflation above that, get you to about 765. And the political benefit of this uh, is you put that in there while you're putting huge increases on the non-defense side of the budget as well. And it at least takes the defense budget off the table uh, for this summer and all the budget debates. Uh, no one in Congress is going to criticize them for a 765 billion, well, some people will still criticize them, but uh, I think Tom would even be happy, McKinsey would be happy uh, with a defense budget of that level, or at least be somewhat satisfied, uh, takes it off the, the table going into an election year. I think that there are plenty of reasons the Biden administration will want to do that. You heard it here first. We have uh, the budget could be anywhere between 730 or 765 billion. Thanks for uh, the agreement here, everyone. Uh, but moving over into the audience Q&A, uh, let's start off talking about the impact of the CR. Um, is there any concern that DOD won't be able to spend all of its money in six months in the event that uh, an omnibus actually passes? 
uh, particularly for O&M accounts that expire uh, at the end of the fiscal year, and the limitations on how much money the Pentagon can put under contract in the last few months of a fiscal year. So open for to, to anyone who would like to answer that. But you have hit on the one account that will have the trouble, and that's O&M. And there's, there likely has been some delayed training, steaming hours, training events, things like that. So if they're going to have trouble spending the money they're given, it's going to be in the O&M uh, accounts, facilities, maybe uh, training days. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think this is yet another reason that Congress needs to look at giving DOD some authority to carry over a limited percentage of O&M money uh, into the start of the next fiscal year. You know, those in the defense budget world know O&M money is one year money. You got to obligate it by the end of the year it's appropriated. Uh, and we run into this problem year after year. It leads to inefficient behavior. Uh, and if they, if Congress would just give DOD uh, some carryover authority, I think it would help smooth things out and prevent that, you know, frantic push to spend at the very end of the fiscal year. Uh, and I mean, you know, there are limitations on how much you can spend at the end of the year. So uh, in the end, it just ends up being money expired, right? And Congress appropriates money for a reason. They want it to be used for a particular purpose. So they need to give some carryover authority to DOD. Got it. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have um, is looking at the effects of a Russian invasion of Ukraine on the budget. Uh, what sort of pressure will O&M, in the event of that happening, uh, place on RDT&E? And does that have the potential to knock the administration off course in its efforts to outpace China technologically? I mean, if you look at what the administration has done thus far, it's been relatively modest in terms of the force deployments um, to Europe, uh, to Poland and to Romania. One of them is a, uh, the movement of forces from Germany to Romania and then additional infantry units that were sent to Poland and I think Romania. And so that's, that's not a huge additional expense. The question is if they remain over time and they become some sort of continuous heel to toe rotation, then that would be more and whether that actually gets plussed up and there's something that is expected to stay over the long run uh, there or those additional um, 8,500 troops that the administration has sort of on alert are, are sent as well and kept over there because whatever happens in Ukraine is unsettled or remains really threatening to some of our allies. In that scenario, if, if it went that way, as Stacy describes, a longer presence, I would foresee a Defense Department supplemental request to Congress. Yeah, and, and I, I would I would add there that you know there there's going to need to be some sort of makeup money for um, weapons and um, you know equipment that we're transferring to Ukraine that's coming out of existing stocks. It'll need to be replaced. Uh, in the coming years. So, you know, maybe they fold that into the 23 request. Maybe it comes back as a supplemental later if there's additional O&M spending as well. Um, and keep in mind that, you know, beyond what Stacy was talking about, um, of deployments of troops in the region, well, we're not going to have boots on the ground in Ukraine. We're not going to be directly involved. We will be involved in terms of providing intel support, ISR support, um, for what's going on in that region. And so there'll be O&M costs to that as well, whether it stays in peacetime or it actually transitions into armed conflict, we're gonna have those bills. You know, I think a Russian, a further Russian invasion of Ukraine will be defining, it won't be maybe a 9-11, but it'll be close to it. We'll see a supplemental of tens of billions of dollars and the European uh, deterrence initiative will get, it. you know, we won't talk about China for probably uh, two years, I would suspect. Uh, one more thing on the supplemental. Another advantage of it is that it allows the Department of Defense to express a geographic priority in a much more targeted way than the rest of the defense budget. Um, generally speaking, the defense budget is really difficult to use as a message about geographical priorities. I mean, in words you can, but in dollars, there's no line item for Russia or China. But with a supplemental, you're able to say, hey, we're adding this additional funding specifically to respond to this contingency. Um, so there as a signal, it offers some advantages. Thanks everyone. Moving into a question more about the politics of the defense budget. 
Uh, with No More Budget Control Act, are there new opportunities for leaders to have freer conversations about defense spending? Do you foresee a new agreement tying domestic and defense spending levels like the dollar for dollar agreements previously that we've seen in agreements like the bipartisan budget acts? I think, you know, the the one nice thing you can say about the Budget Control Act, right? There, there's a lot of bad things to say about it. But the one nice thing is it provided a structure for having a debate in Congress. It set it up as a very simple defense and non-defense debate, right? Uh, and it gave us structure and it actually gave us some predictability, believe it or not, it did give us some predictability in getting to deals, right? We knew how the deal was gonna be structured. Uh, is it dollar for dollar? Is it something less than that? But you know, we know the basic outline of the deal. I think what Congress is struggling with right now is what is the structure for the deal? This is our first year outside the budget caps and I think Congress is kind of flailing and trying to figure out how do we get to a deal? Because yeah, Democrats technically, you know, control both chambers of Congress, but they don't have functioning majority in the Senate. Uh, and they can't get anything through the Senate without some sort of bipartisan deal. So, you know, I think that's where we're struggling right now is that what is that structure for a deal? But with that said, I don't think that there is appetite barring some sort of a fiscal crisis. Uh, for us to get back to anything like the Budget Control Act, uh, because I think there was wide recognition that setting arbitrary spending levels uh, for a 10-year period, uh, and they were just arbitrary, um, that that is not good, that's not good for defense, that's not good for non-defense. Um, I'll just add, I think the structure now for looking at budget deals are the midterm elections followed closely by the presidential election. Those, those are the lenses by which people will start to view these budget deals. Thanks all. Moving on to a question that's a bit about the geographic budgeting that Travis was mentioning. Um, they asked, do you expect there will be an increased emphasis on the need to accelerate key regional capabilities like the Guam defense system to outpace threats from adversaries like North Korea? And I guess on top of this, I'd like to add, I mean, what value do you see the Pacific Deterrence Initiative um, in, in terms as, of a regional budgeting tool? Do you think it has increased value in actually making the department focus on competition with China? Or do you think it's more of a budgeting gimmick of sorts? I'll jump in here. Um, so I'm, I'm a two minds on this. I think it's actually a good thing. You've seen this with Europe and what was the European Reassurance Initiative then became EDI, the European Deterrence Initiative. It helped to focus attention and make sure that there were resources available to make largely posture changes in Europe and to improve the United States and NATO's ability to defend the Northeastern Front, mainly the, the um, Black Sea region. Also, there were some plus ups made there. In the Pacific, I think that PDI is intended to serve the same purpose, though the budget submission that was put in last year by the Biden administration was a lot more focused on platforms than posture and seemed to be fairly significantly disconnected from what the Indo-Pacific Command had requested um, in their submission to Congress. And there may be good reasons for there to be differences because Indo-PACOM is very much focused on today and OSD is thinking about the long-term, near-term and long-term and has to balance across time. But I, I do think that um, it could be a very useful vehicle and a way to force some of the posture changes that administration after administration to talk about continuity and strategy that has been promising to make in the Pacific um, for more than a decade at this point. I personally would not prioritize, um, you know, a, a active defense system for Guam. I think that there's a lot more bang for your buck in terms of um, implementing a robust system of layered passive defenses on existing bases and then expanding some of the locations that U.S. forces have access to. But um, I, I do think that drawing attention to it and making it easier for people to call out what is being spent on that helps to place pressure on the different um, uh, actors to make sure that they follow through and actually do spend money on something that there isn't a strong constituency for typically in the services or in the department. 
That's great. Uh, Thanks, Stacey. Anyone else like to weigh in? Yeah, uh, I'll just say Stacey's exactly right. There is no constituency in the Pentagon for pouring concrete in Guam or Palau or things like that. The services, you know, want to spend money on things that train and equip their forces and typically uh, have just paid lip service to what the combatant commanders have wanted. And so this PDI was kind of a shot across the Pentagon's bow that you're gonna to have to listen to the combatant commanders. This, it, it is still inefficient for a combatant commander to come in at the last minute with a contradictory budget request. So somehow this needs to get resolved earlier in the budget process uh, so that these combatant commanders are factored in and baked in earlier uh, into the cake than coming in at the last minute. All right, I'll, I'll be the dissenter here. Uh, I, I think PDI is largely a budget tagging exercise. Uh, and I think the combatant commanders already have plenty of power <laughs> uh, in the process, perhaps too much power, right? Uh, and you know, I think that's why CENTCOM is still getting a lot more resources than I think the strategy would justify uh, and probably SOUTHCOM, AFRICOM as well. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm not a big fan of trying to budget regionally. I think, you know, the vast majority of our capabilities uh, and even our bases um, have global, uh, global reach, global implications. Uh, and so I, I don't know that it's that helpful to have something like a the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. If there are specific things I grant you, like, you know, building up capabilities on Guam uh, that are specific, you know, uh, in terms of defending against Chinese aggression, great. Uh, and maybe that's a good, you know, uh, thing to have in a, a separate supplemental fund. Uh, but the way that I think this is being executed right now is just trying to go through and and tag things that we were going to invest in anyway and say, well, that's for the Pacific. And, you know, lots of things are like that. And so it ends up being a bit arbitrary about what do you tag and what do you not tag. Glad we have some dissenting views there, uh, opposing viewpoints on both sides. That's great. Um, this isn't a question specifically on the FY23 request, but it's focusing on the PPBE Commission, the Budget Process Commission. What do you think that the, what do you think, what would you identify as the one major overhaul that's most important that really needs to come out of this process if you could narrow it down to something? I'll give you a minute to think because I know that's, that's pretty tough. I'm not gonna answer your question directly. So I'll talk and give everyone else time to think of better answers. Um, I think that this is really important and should be pursued and that PPB overhaul is obviously long overdue, but that is a long-term process and that's going to be a hard thing to uh, work out and figure out what will make significant changes and what will be acceptable to um, the Hill as well. Uh, in the near term, there's a lot that the department can do to actually utilize the authorities that it has and to push the current process farther so that it moves faster. And I think that both things have to be done simultaneously. So you have to see that within acquisition offices, program officers are actually using the authorities that they have and that they're willing to take some risks and do things that traditionally um, there have not been a lot of incentives for, and that that will start to help. And we need to start to make progress now. We can't wait for a, a complete overhaul, though it's clear that the system that the um, department relies on right now is quite antiquated. Seamus, this is the topic of your next webinar. Uh, just this question, I think, for this group, honestly, because there's so much to talk about. There's a hundred good ideas ready to take now. Like the commission really, they didn't, they don't have to work that hard if they don't want to because they, everybody knows what needs to get done. Um, for example, reprogramming, you know, raising the threshold for reprogramming, having more baskets of money, you know, for things like technology and software, as opposed to like individual PE numbers that don't translate well for moving fast. The list goes on and on. But if I were king for a day, proverbially, and this won't happen. So um, now I'm gonna, like Stacy, I'm not gonna answer the question, but if I were working for a day and it could happen, I would say the single most important thing would be that Congress would then, be, would, would, to borrow the Pentagon term, turn the telescope and reform itself in terms of, its, of, of how it's um, helping the Defense Department um, buy outcomes and, and items and 
of course I'm talking about that that has a whole range of implications it's not just like two-year budgeting and that sort of thing but that's part of it let me let me tell you an easy one I could first off we need a 2022 appropriations bill because the uh, the PPBE commission counts as a new start so they can't start spending their big budget and and hire all their fancy consultants and staff until they get this appropriation. You know, uh, Mackenzie touched on it. I think they need port some flexibility in portfolio management. And it won't happen all at once. They need to pick a couple of portfolios and then they need to do confidence building between uh, the Pentagon and Congress to make sure they trust each other. But, you know, allow a, uh, a service to move money among hel helicopter programs or for the Navy among shipbuilding programs, something like that. Try a couple of programs see if anybody abuses it and then uh, go from there. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, there's no silver bullet that's going to fix the whole thing. It's going to be hundreds of changes uh, that are needed to really update it. But, you know, uh, my thoughts are, you know, first of all, let's start with the PBE system itself with the silent P and the underappreciated E, right? The planning guidance often late, too late to affect the programming. Um, or, you know, after the fact, you're trying to figure out, you know, what do we say to match what we're doing? Um, so sort of the tail wagging the dog in the process. So that's a problem. I think on the execution side, um, it really needs to be about speed and flexibility. You know, it shouldn't take two years for an idea to go from inception to actually getting funding that you're able to spend. Um, we need, you know, to be able to be faster, we need flexibility. At the same time, though, we've got to preserve the oversight and insight uh, that Congress is going to need. Uh, and that is a fundamental tenet of democracy. Let's not forget that, you know, that this is the people's money uh, and, you know, it is the people's government. Uh, and so, you know, we've still got to maintain, you know, that insight and oversight uh, responsibility for Congress. Uh, they're not going to go along with any changes that don't do that anyway. But we can do that while giving DOD more flexibility in how money is spent and allowing the whole cycle to work faster, to give it more speed to it. Um, so, you know, I think things like uh, different rules we have for different colors of money, that needs to be completely reconceptualized. You know, the fact that you've got end of year money that's about to expire, that doesn't make sense. That's not how people work today. Um, you know, we need to find other systems to use um, you know, to, to make it more flexible, uh, but at the same time, keeping it accountable. Got it. And one final question uh, before we wrap up. What do we see uh, in the future and in the FY23 request for space investments um, or the idea of new space, an emphasis on on-orbit servicing and manufacturing? Um, I guess, Todd, this would probably go over, over to you. Yeah, you know, we had General Raymond uh, come speak a couple of weeks ago. Um, he seemed pretty excited about what they've got in their 23 request. Of course, he couldn't give us any details uh, at the time. Uh, but I'm expecting, you know, that we're going to see a pretty robust request for the Space Force. Of course, you know, you could increase the Space Force's budget by 10, 20 percent, uh, and it doesn't you know, affect the top line that much. So it's easy to do um, in that respect. But I think we're going to see, you know, a lot more investments in new space missions. Uh, yeah, that is the military getting into new space missions. He's already talked about tactical ISR. Uh, that's not really been a mission uh, for the Space Force. ISR from space has been on the Intel side for years, but there is a role for the Space Force in tactical ISR. Um, and also, you know, uh, getting involved in things like, you know, um, you know, actual movement of objects uh, in space, uh, in space transportation, in space logistics. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more investments uh, going into those areas. Great. Well, I would like to thank all of our guests for joining us today, sharing their insights. Mackenzie, Stacy, Travis, Tom, Todd, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and hopefully we will see the budget request soon. Mm -hmm.